Okay, you just threw out a great idea for an episode. So we turned on mics because this is genius and everyone should get to hear the process behind setting up the ground rules. So tell me again, what is the idea you were just starting to throw out for what we're going to talk about? I made a note to myself. Let me just read you the note. Um, do you do this? Do you come up with ideas and just make a note? And I do. It allows me to move on. Yeah, exactly. So this is my note. What if we did an episode about things that would happen again if Earth started over and we both bring things to the table? So Excellent. Yeah, so the idea is Earth starts over and there are things that happen again because of, you know, it's, it's always going to happen. Like, no matter what happens, these things would happen if we started right. Earth. Yeah. But depending on the ground rules, we're dealing with two completely different sets of questions. Well, so if the ground rules are... What do you mean? Everything... Well, I mean, if, if the ground rules of physics and geography are the same, so everything is still where it is, you know, temperature, climate, composition of the atmosphere the human body, human lifespan, all of that, if that is all consistent with what we currently exist with, then the question is all about sociology. How do people work? What will people come up with? If we roll the dice on everything, where land is, what the temperature is like, how physics work, then we're into like simulation theory and hypothetical realities. And both are fun, but which one do you want to do? Well, I think you're talking about the difference in playing the board game Risk versus playing the board game Settlers of Catan, right? Oh, so, dude, did you just think of that off the top of your head? Yeah. Because so, that like, that's a great analogy. <laughs> thanks. So so Risk would be you keep all the, the land masses the same, mm-hmm. and the only thing that changes the dynamic are the decisions that the humans make. Mm-hmm. But Catan, or Catan, however you say it, like I've when you done. deal out the board game, you change where the, you know, where the different things are located, where the rock is located, where the, the wheat is located. Right. But none of that matters because it won't affect my strategy one way or the other. I'm just building the longest road and accepting my loss. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Start that over a hundred times. That's what I'm doing. It's important to build the, lo- yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I really like, uh, I really like the longest road, which really bit me in the butt when we played the uh, the train game. Which what was the name of the train game? Ticket to Ride, Days yeah. of Wonder game. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to make the longest track, and that ended up biting me in the butt because that's adorable. Yeah, we we developed. So my wife and I played the kids, and we got our butts handed to us because we were doing things like that. We were building like we were trying to connect these cities, but what you really needed to do is just. Yeah, anyway, I figured it out. I'm going to slay the kids next time. Good, they have it coming. So which question do you want to answer? The sociology question or the simulation theory question? Well, I mean, what if we did both? Uh, Okay, I'm listening, but you heard my skeptical eh. Yeah. Okay, for example, can I just throw one out right now? And then we'll we'll come back later. I'll allow it. So have you ever read the the Space Trilogy by C.S. Lewis? Have you ever read that? A long time ago. Okay, so they're interesting. Not my favorite. I think about them a lot. I mean, they didn't have a great profound impact on my life, but it's amazing how much I think about them. And one of the things that happens is the main character goes to, I think it's Mars, and he meets... He meets one of the Hrasa, one of the, uh, the Martians, basically, and he's learning their language, and they get in a boat. And it is a... It's a physical object that's, you know, turned upside down. And so it floats on water or liquid or whatever it is this lake is that they're going to go out on. And the main character thinks to himself, he's like, huh, you know, there's only so many ways you can build a boat. Like that boat's going to happen. Like if you want to do something and you, you want to take advantage of the physical property of buoyancy in order to move through a, you know, a viscous liquid you're going to arrive at boat 100 times out of 100. Yeah. It's the path of least resistance to traverse across a liquid. Yeah, I, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm, I'm thinking of doing with this episode. What do you mean? Well, I mean, that's exactly the kind of answer that I anticipated we'd come up with. You, you want to know my very first thought? What? Handshakes. Huh. If people have hands, there's always going to be some form of handshake or interaction that communicates trust because your hands are what you can use to manipulate the world around you 
And by forfeiting control of that to another person, you're extending a gesture of trust. You now have 50% control of my hand and I have 50% control of your hands and therefore we have trust. And I think we'll always come up with some sort of gesture like that, even if you started the world over a billion times. Oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing, isn't it? I think this is going to be a good episode. Ah, so what do we do now? I think maybe we do another episode down the road. Heck, maybe even the next episode where we get into more simulation theory kind of stuff. But I think we should go with the ground rules we have, start with the simpler question, and then work our way out in a future episode to the more complex question. What is the simpler question again? The simpler question is, if we started the world over just as it is, but culture started over from scratch, what things would happen again and again and again every single time you restarted it? Okay, so we're going to keep the map the same. We're going to keep yep. bodies of water the same. Physics. We're going to keep physics the same. Well, what about... Um, human anatomy. Where, where are we dropping humans first? Are we doing that? Ooh, that's a good question. Okay, well, where did they where did they start first this time around? What's your understanding of that? M- most people think Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a good case to be made. Uh, culturally, you've got the river civilizations as kind of the, the leading theory for where writing and civilization started. So that would be... Like the Fertile Crescent? Uh, Indus River, Tigris Euphrates. Am I saying that right? Is uh, it called the the Fertile Crescent? Uh huh. Yeah, Fertile okay. Crescent. Um, and then the Nile and like the Yangtze Yellow River. So China, India, Mesopotamia, and Egypt are. Yeah, I think we start from. Hmm, I don't know. What do you want to do? My history brain is getting ready to take over and dominate the plan, and I I don't want to do that. I don't know, man. I uh, I'm game with just saying we're just gonna start over with with humans and with dirt the way it is. But I don't know. Is it, is it truly a harder question for if you, if you play it Catan style, is it a harder question? I'm not sure that it is. I think it is. Why are we talking about the same thing when you say Catan style though? I mean, Catan style is this, we we take, we take a globe, the earth, we take the globe and then we look at the distribution of land and water It's the same proportion. It's the same proportion, but you get a random number generator and you figure out where the land is massed. And you re-Pangea the whole dang thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to keep the tilt of the earth the same and the the distance from the sun the same. So effectively our atmosphere. 23 and a half degrees. Yeah, exactly. That's important. The moon is important too. For reasons we'll discuss. Yeah. And that stays the same as well, right? We're not messing with the moon? Yeah. Okay. So we're not messing with the length of the year like game of thrones does do they do that yeah winter there is like 12 years long oh yeah 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 it is huh. yeah that's how you can say winter is coming for six whole seasons and be <laughs> telling the truth the entire time huh okay i think what's going to happen though is that in the early going of our conversation we're going to reason our way right back to what history reasoned to to a certain point I think before the killing and the kingdoms and the warfare and the human manipulation of land starts, things are just kind of destined to end up the same way. But we can we can debate that out. Oh, man. This is going to be fun. You could screw around with when, like, famous leaders and teachers. Yeah. You could put Jesus somewhere else at a different time. Yeah, like now. And the Bible is a video game instead of a book. <laughs> Whoa, no, no, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Doesn't it? (laughs) Okay, so uh, we need to succinctly define the problem. So if you started the world over a million times, what things would happen a million times? There you go. Like it. All right. So, okay, what's the next step? We just go away and think and we make notes and then we come back prepared. I want you to go to your bidet for 14 hours. Yep. I'm going to do the same. Yep. That's 28 hours of the combined opportunity for the warm water of knowledge and wisdom to enter us <laughs> and for us to then be able to release that upon others. I I don't like the upon <laughs> others part. Could you just re-say that without the upon or others? <laughs> okay. I'm going to leave you with that. I'm going to go think and I'll see you after a break. Okay. Good deal. All right. One thing... I take a lot of pride in here on Notem Questions, the podcast, is 
our ability to make ads that are just normal and good. But there's one thing I think that we can do to make it even better, if I'm honest. Oh? You know how when we were growing up, ads would have jingles and stuff like that? Yes. What if we were to do like a jingly version of the ad this time? Would you be down for that? I don't think they want that. The vocal thing. It's not exactly our strong suit. So this episode of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by HelloFresh. Tell me what kind of jingle you, you want. The promo code is NDQ80. We like HelloFresh. Right. So I'm thinking like a song that explains what HelloFresh is in a jingly type way. Okay. At HelloFresh, <laughs> it's a meal kit delivery service. They shop and plan and deliver step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients. So you can just cook, eat, and enjoy at HelloFresh. Uh, that was good. What I can I can tell, dude. You're doing this little um like you're going one step beyond singing and you're doing a like a like an in, I'm trying too hard to sing singing. Like you're doing that on purpose, aren't you? Uh, who can say? <laughs> America's about choices and freedom these days. And everyone loves family and food. So why not reconnect with our heritage, <laughs> roots, and tradition by gathering in the kitchen to cook our food with HelloFresh. We'll send you delicious food in a box that comes right to your doorstep and it's properly refrigerated with things that won't destroy the environment, which we also care about as Americans. Oh, God. You can gather with your family, put in 30 minutes or less, and enjoy a meal with once again HelloFresh. How was that? And was that you. Ooh. Did I do it right? Nailed it. <laughs> Dude, Get I'm really $80 impressed. $80 off your first month by going to HelloFresh.com slash NDQ80 and enter the promo code NDQ80. Good job, Matt. I feel good Thanks about this. Thanks very much for that. Thanks, HelloFresh, for sponsoring the podcast and letting everybody put tasty goodness in their face holes. Did you try that smoky steak that I told you about? No, I did not, but I did try the uh, pork carnita tacos. Oh, delicious. Dig it, yeah. Yeah, we did like some like kind of pork nacho thing. Oh, yeah. Did good. God, it's good stuff. All right, let's go talk about how the world would work out if we started it all over. But I'll tell you one thing that would happen every time we started the world over. What? That HelloFresh song that I just wrote <laughs> from my heart right now. Obviously. HelloFresh, seriously, thank you. Yeah, for realsies, it's a big deal. It helps us do the podcast. You can get HelloFresh for your family by going to HelloFresh.com slash NDQ80. Use the promo code NDQ80 at checkout. I mean, this works whether or not you sing jingles to yourself or not, whatever. You can you can pick the classic option, the veggie option, the family option. Pick the best meal for your family. Make it together. Sit around the table. Have a meal. It's genuinely family changing the way this works. And, and your tummy, tummy will appreciate, appreciate it, too. It too. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was beautiful. Okay, we took a couple days. We went and made lists. How many do you have on your list? Oh, I don't know, man. I'm looking at it. Uh, pfft, I don't know. Maybe 10? I don't know. We what made, did you do while you made your list? Well, mostly drove places. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I had a conversation with some people or a specific person, Chad, a guy that I know. We talked about it a little bit. I just mm -hmm. thought about stuff. What 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 the heck? Did you, what did you do? Did you go on a walk and like get a lollipop and have one of those little sailor hats and just walk around and think about stuff? What did yeah, you... one of those big giant swirly lollipops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. <laughs> and my hat has the little blue tassel on it. Yeah, just it's like a, it's, Donald it's, Duck. That's my little sailor outfit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Whenever I need to think hard, I just put on my little sailor outfit and walk up and down Main Street here in Lander. Yeah, makes sense. The answer usually comes to me. That or verbal abuse. <laughs> Or both. No, I, um, let me see. I did a little driving. I did a little sitting here at my desk, staring forward thinking. And I thought about it for a real long time, watching the water swirl down the drain, thinking about the days of my existence passing by quickly in the shower. That's really my favorite time to think, actually. It's your favorite time to call me, is what it is. It's true. No, but daytime is your favorite time to call me. But I, we've had a lot of shower conversations all by distance. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm in favor of keeping it that way, brother. So, okay. Uh, do you want to go first or do I get to go first? How, how do you want to do this? Uh, okay. So just to be clear, we've got the world resets and how many things would happen every single time the world resets. We're keeping yes. dirt. We're keeping water boundaries. We're keeping all that the same. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to lead with this. Okay. I, and before you do, yeah. before you do, no matter how much sense I think you make, I'm going to try to offer at least one counter argument, even if I think you're absolutely right. Is that okay? Yeah, I don't care. Okay, that'll be fun. All right, well, I, I know sometimes you get a little fragile yeah, when people right. push back or disagree, and that's okay. I just I, want you to uh, be ready. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm the fragile one. Got it. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, 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 so we've taken light, playful ribbing and gone into the realm of... Re- oh, no, okay. No. All right. We'll say how we really feel about things. No, no. Go ahead with uh, with your first item. I'm sure it's great. <laughs> all right. So I think that um, our humans, uh, assuming that humans happen the same every time, I think our relationship with animals change just a little bit. So for example... I think it's possible in said theoretical world that happens millions and millions of times and, you know, different variations happen. I think it's possible that mastodons could become beasts of burden. How cool would that Whoa. be? Whoa. Yeah, how cool would that be? I don't know how cool that would be. They seem big and dangerous. Well, they're basically elephants, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so... There are African elephants and Asian elephants now. And these would be Siberian elephants. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, big woolly mammoth looking things, mastodons. So mastodons and woolly mammoths are different. I, they are. Yeah, I, I don't know the difference off the top of my head. But I think it is completely possible to think spelling. that humans could domesticate these things. Don't you think it'd be cool? And ride them into war. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that war elephants... You know, obviously, you do know that war elephants are a thing. What's the name of the person on top of a war elephant? It starts with a Z. Really? There's a name? No, I, I, I'm... I, It's not like, oh, I can't remember. I didn't know there was a name for that. Oh, yeah, there's a totally a name for that. One second. Guy who Legolas shoots with arrows? No, no, no. It's like... uh, It's got a really cool name, like Mahook or something like that. Let me find it. I, I'm Googling right really? now. Really? Yeah. Okay, and this is uh, not oh, just is. an elephant rider. Mahout. This is an elephant. Whoa, whoa, one more time. Mahout. M-A-H-O-U-T. I have heard that word before. Yeah. A, a mahout is an elephant rider, trainer, or keeper. Usually, mahout starts as a boy in the family profession, and when he is assigned to an ele- he's assigned an elephant early in his life. That's awesome. So, in, in, Wow, he's like a Targaryen. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. In my little simulation world, I, I choose to believe that... It's possible to domesticate mastodons or woolly mammoths, and ancient man would have done that. But isn't... Okay, uh, that's fascinating, and we need to talk about it more. But isn't the point of the exercise, like, stuff that you think would have happened the same way every time? Oh, really? I just really wanted this to happen. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, no, no, let's let's do that. I just... You're right. You know, this is our first one, and I feel like we kind of set up the question, oh. and I feel like you took it a little different angle, because I have some things that I want, too, like jetpacks. Okay, but, look, you're exactly right. So, I just got to thinking about this way too much, and I really, for some reason, wanted to shoehorn mastodons in there. Okay, so... you, you Destin. Well, I'm sorry, dude. You, you want to go... What did you name your mastodon? I didn't name it, but it would be Bree. Oh. Okay. <laughs> So, That's the correct answer. So, okay, the first thing I think would happen the same every single time, 100% of the time, would be bricks. We would make little CMUs or little modular units. Uh, what's CMU? I think humans, every single time, would make what's called a CMU, a concrete masonry unit kind of thing. Like a brick is basically mud that we fire And we turn it into a building unit so that we can make things like walls, structures, things of this nature. I think naturally, if you end up in the wild, you know, naked people running around, at some point we're going to pile up mud and make houses. But I think naturally it would always progress to a modular masonry unit. I think that's going to happen every single time, 100% of the time. And in support of that, and I'm doing a terrible job of pushing back on you, in support of that, that is what happened. Everybody thought of building units in one way or another. And even in the places where it was too cold to access 
mold or then reharden dirt. We just did it with ice and snow. Yeah, igloos. Yeah. But interestingly, there are places where the mud hut is still a thing. And I asked about it one time when I was in a part of the world where that exists. And what I was told was that it's more efficient than using brick because of the type of soil and the its stickiness quotient, viscosity, I don't know what you call it, and the climate, that it, it's it's a unique kind of dirt and mud that really you can just sling it against itself and it will stick there and harden without having to use brick. So even the places where we see that not in use, I think if you started the world over a billion times, if you had access to dirt that you could just heap up and it would work as a wall, you would always heap it up instead of making a brick because what's the point, right? Yeah. Did I ever tell you I made a Smarter Every Day about this and we literally made a house out of mud bricks? No, I don't mm. No, I haven't watched your whole back catalog. Yeah, Smarter Every Day 18, I was in the Gambia, and I met this guy, and we were good friends, and he was working on his house. Like, he was building a house. And the way they did it is they had this little mud frame, or this mud, I don't know how you explain it. It wasn't made out of mud. It was made out of metal, but it was a a square. Like chicken wire? No, it was like a little square that you would set on the ground, and... um. You just filled it up with mud, and then you use your hand, and you scrape the top off of it, and then you just pull the frame off of it, and it would leave this mud brick on the ground, and then you just let it dry out. His frame was made out of steel. He just had a local welder, you know, basically uh, weld up four sides into a little wall. He'd sling mud in it with his hands, and then um, at the end of that, he would push it in to the all crevices of the little frame, And then he would take his fingers and he would rake across the top. He would put these stripes on the top of the mud brick. And the reason he would do that is when it would be dried by the sun, he wanted there to be rough, hard edges on top so that when he would stack them on top of each other with more wet mud, it would grip, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So surface roughness was important. But anyway, it's a beautiful thing that I got to experience in Africa. But uh, it's Smarter Every Day 18. If you get bored, check it out. Okay. Okay, so whether you build something out of bricks, out of sticks, out of snow, out of mud, or after out of synthetic material, one way or another, I think that if you started the world over a bazillion times with human bodies being the way they are, you would end up with living spaces, dining spaces, food prep spaces, bathroom spaces, and sleeping spaces in all of the houses forever. Really? I mean, why wouldn't you? Those are the things that people need to do in a house. Okay, let's say it again. So sleep. Okay. Prep food. Mm Mm-hmm. A kitchen. uh, A bathroom. Dispose of the food bodily that you just prepped and ate. Hmm. So you got to clean up and you got to get rid of waste. Dang, I'm thinking about the International Space Station. You've got a a little closet that you sleep in. In Node 3, they they go to the bathroom. No, not node three. That's in the, yeah, I guess it's node three. And then they have this this other module where they eat, a, like a galley. Yeah, you're right, dude. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's just going to be houses. For, I mean, you go anywhere and that's how they, I mean, unless you're dealing with an extreme poverty situation where some of that has to happen outside. But even then, there is somewhere, even if it's outside, within a living area that does all of those things. Dude, I just got a dad text that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, okay. My daughter's rabbit died. Oh, what was the rabbit's name? Uh, Smokey. And okay. it was either Smokey or Shadow. I forget which one it was. So I need to call my daughter very fast and tell her that I'm proud okay. of her because she did do a very good job with this rabbit. Can I do that real quick? Yeah, I'll just sit tight. No worries. Okay, one second. Maybe I'll just... Go inside and hug my chinchilla. Okay. It's just times like this. <laughs> this is important. I'll, I'll, one second. Okay, I'm back. All right. Everything good? Uh, no, it's not good. She was pretty tore up. Um, she, we had a rabbit a while back and, um, something happened with its equipment. We had like, you know what a rabbit hutch is? It's like a little area outside that you keep your rabbit in. Yeah, of course. And so, um, we had this little area and one of her rabbits years ago died 
and I wouldn't let her get another rabbit because I'm like, no, baby, you know, we take care of our animals. And, you know, you obviously didn't in this case because the heat lamp wasn't functioning. Ooh. Didn't know and the, mm-hmm. the rabbit froze and it was, a, it was a big deal. And so it was a very teachable moment. And so um, the text I just got said, she's sad, her rabbit died, she'd fed it, she had watered it, heated it, et cetera, and she's afraid you're going to be upset. And uh, mm-hmm. I had to call very quickly and address that and just tell her straight up, you did great with this rabbit. It must have been sick or something. Yeah, well, I mean, they're a fragile animal that reproduces quickly for a reason. Oh, I never thought about that. Huh. Yeah. So anyway, we'll probably go for ice cream or something tonight and talk about it. But she did a, she did great with this rabbit, man. I'm very proud of her. And honestly, like, no joking. At this point, we're so dang attached to the little rat, which is chinchilla, yeah. that we have at our house. Like, yeah, I, I get it. I can picture how my kids would feel if Qui-Gon Chin, the chinchilla, were to pass away. What about <laughs> what about you, man? Every time I call you, you're like, hey, little chinchilla what? buddy. <laughs> No, that's uh, that's an act to make the kids feel like I care about it. Which is, which is why it happens when they're asleep and it's just you and the chinchilla in, in your chair. Well, in case they sneak up. Oh, okay. I want them to know. I want them to really... <laughs> I got to sell it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I obviously wouldn't... I don't have feelings for a, a rat. <laughs> but if I did, I think one of the things that I would like most about him is how... Whenever other people come in the room, he kind of scurries to the back of the cage. But when I come in the room, he scurries up to the front. Oh, dude. And he knows I like to pet him on his tiny little chinchilla chin. Yeah. And so he stands up on his back legs and puts up his hands like I got a gun or something. <laughs> and he's like, I'm all yours. And then I scratch his little chin and he leans his little chin forward and he makes this little sound like. And that's real fun. And then I put my hand out and he jumps into it. And Does he really? He, yeah, that happens. And then I give him a little dust bath. And he pokes his head out of the little dust bath and looks at me and he's like, I can't, I don't speak chinchillese, but I know what he's saying. It's, I ain't quite done yet. And then he goes back in there and he scurries around. And then after the second bath, he comes out and he hops back in my hand and I yeah. put him back in the uh, little cage there and then I give him a little almond or something. And he takes it with both hands, both teeny tiny little adorable hands and he holds it and he, he just kind of nibbles that down. He makes eye contact with me. So if... If I cared about him, which I don't, those would be the things I would find endearing. I understand. That's a hard act to, to just keep up, though. So, Yeah, well, I'm doing my best. I want the kids to feel like he's a part of the family and accepted. <laughs> okay, anyway, that was a weird uh, rabbit trail. <laughs> 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 Your turn. Go ahead. I think if we started the world over 11 bazillion times, we would shake each other's hands and or hug 11 bazillion times. Shake hands? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, as I was saying earlier, I, I think it's the gesture of vulnerability. We shake with the right hand. Most people are right-handed. And it's a way to say I'm not doing anything else with this hand other than extending you peace and gratitude. And the hug thing is an incredibly vulnerable gesture. And also, it's a gesture that makes a ton of sense in a way that, because we assume that humans reproduce in the same way in this hypothetical reality we're talking about, it's not erotic or sexual necessarily. It's just a way to express, well, exactly what it is, an embrace. I affirm you. I appreciate you. And here's a way to demonstrate that with physical closeness that passes in an acceptable amount of time that doesn't make a person feel uncomfortable. I think they're both gestures of openness that we would duplicate every single time just because of how our bodies are shaped and what we do with them. Hmm. That makes me think about other things that are body dependent. Like such as? We find the opposite sex attractive in certain ways in different periods of time, right? Like you've seen ancient paintings, not ancient, but old paintings. Oh, yeah. Okay. In in the idea of uh, the perfect male or female body at certain periods of time changes... And so I wonder if we would arrive at some of the silly things that humans do now. To primp and preen and be attractive yeah. to the opposite sex. Like or earrings. if we're trying to attract the same sex to the same sex. Do you think earrings would happen every time? They seem to have happened everywhere. Really? Well, think about it. Earrings, adornments, jewelry, necklaces, bracelets. I mean, some guy's out in a field and he finds a Viking horde 
from uh, a Viking treasure hoard, that is, from the 9th century AD, what's in it? Uh, gold, silver, adornment for women, jewelry. What do you find in Peru? I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Everyone figured out that there are certain parts of the body that you can wrap things around and they won't fall off. And also certain parts of the body that have, depending on one's gender, a certain elegance to them. Like the neckline and the clavicle on a woman is just, sorry if this is getting a little bit creepy, but there's just, it's a very beautiful, natural focal point for the eye. The, the neck of a woman is usually shaped a little bit differently than the neck of a man. And it is adorned nicely with jewelry. And so I think everybody figured that out independent from each other. It's not like the Incas traveled to India or Mesopotamia to figure out that necklaces were cool. It's a nice way to accent the body. Yeah, but I think I think that has to do with the operating system that's running on humans' minds, right? Like, if we have a certain operating system load in our brains, then we're going to be attracted to that, you know? And so I think these things okay. are a function of the human mind. It's interesting that all of these things that we're talking about seem to be a function of the human mind and how it works and how it interacts with the physical world. I got a few on my list that don't work that way. Hmm. But here again, I think my other point still has validity too, that while there might be other parts of the body that are pretty, some parts of the body are easier to adorn than others. Some parts of the body are easier to pierce without consequence than others. So like bracelets and necklaces make a ton of sense because it doesn't fall off. There's something narrow to wrap a thing around. Whereas like, I don't know, like a, a belt is just not as ornamental as a necklace or a bracelet. And I think it's just because of like the size of a waist versus the size of a wrist. Hmm. Well, I think it has to do with the proportions of that body part relative to the ones next to it. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, on, on some people, belts don't work because of the the width to height ratio of that particular part of their body. Huh. Like like an obese person, the belt would want to fall down. Mm-hmm. Or somebody on, you know, that has hips, the belt would work better. Yeah. But I guess you're right. Bracelets, necks, it's just naturally going to happen every time, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, man, it makes me wonder about backpacks. Do you think backpacks would happen every time? I told you about the, the hollowed-out monkey backpack that I saw in Equatorial Guinea, right? Yeah. We've talked about that on here. Correct. Yeah. So that seemed pretty natural. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think it would happen every time. Oh, you don't go I'm to, not sure you fanny don't, packs would happen every time. I think they would. But you don't go to the British Museum and see backpacks, you know? Like historically. You see quivers. Oh, would, would, okay. Before we get down to the specifics. Uh, yes, that's already on my list. Just don't, don't go further down that one yet. Let's talk about human conflict in general. Uh, okay. Let me just, uh, so we agree on handshakes and hugs. Yeah. They'd happen every time. I agree. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. So talking with my buddy, we were trying to come up with stuff like this. And what about human conflict in general? We were thinking that because human Pride and envy are things. No matter what you do, if you have humans, you're going to have envy and you're going to have pride. Every single time you reset the world, there's going to be conflict and war. Every time. I agree with the conclusion. I don't agree with how you got there. What do you mean? It's not just about envy and pride. It's also about love, compassion, protectionism, fear, irrational fear. You don't have to be envious. How, how is war about love? Uh, I will fight to protect those I love. I don't want war. I'm not looking for it. I hate conflict. I hate war. But if I have to engage in physical conflict to someone, with someone, um, I might just roll over and die if it were just me. Whatever. But I have kids and I love them. I have a wife and I love her. Well, I think you're talking about step two. I'm talking about step one. What would cause someone to be aggressive toward another to begin with? And I'm talking about step one and a half in saying Response fear to and irrational fear are part of what gets you into war every single time you restart the universe as well. Because no one has to pose an actual threat to me for that to get in my head. I can imagine a threat. I can become paranoid or just even the possibility that they could hurt me could cause me to hone my ability to fight. Oh, okay. So you're talking about like these... Um uncontacted 
people groups that when an airplane goes overhead, they'll shoot weapons at it yeah, because the they Sentinel just want to keep it away. Mm-hmm. Sure. The who? What word did you say? The Sentinelese. Sentinel Island is that little island in the Indian Ocean where that kid, for whatever reason, sounds like maybe he was trying to do something Christian. Uh, he went to that forbidden island and they just killed him immediately. Hmm. Totally uncontacted group or it's been contacted, but it hasn't gone well. Hmm. There's another group like that in Ecuador. In Ecuador. Yeah. They're called the, the Alka or the Warani. There's a book oh, I read sure. a long time ago called Through Gates of Splendor. Yeah. I've read the book. Yeah. The, um, Nate Saint, who's this guy that flew airplanes for something called MAF. He, uh, he did some really cool stuff. Anyway, he was killed by that particular tribe. And what's crazy is that his wife then went and hung out with the tribe. It's pretty interesting. That whole story out is pretty interesting. Out and befriended that tribe. Oh, yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. Yeah, I actually just went through that book a couple months ago. You know what's even crazier? Tell me. Some of her uh, relatives, uh, I'll just say descendants, live here in Huntsville. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't it's... think that's actually crazier. Okay, yeah, you're right. I'm just going to call you on that. I think it's way crazier to go and track down the people who murdered your husband with spears and be like, we should be friends than it is to believe that his descendants live somewhere. Uh, good point. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm just going to yeah. call you on that one. I mean. <laughs> Excellent point. That is cool, though, that they're in the neighborhood there. Yeah. Uh, I do okay. think war happens every time. Can I push that a step further? Uh, yeah, because I'd like to as well. Okay. If you said no, I don't know what I would have done done next. I think I would have gone with baseball next. Um. I think every weapon of war that we've come up with would be invented all over again every single time. Every single one. Uh, you're wrong on that one. I do Tell appreciate it. Um, because I've seen the development of weapons of war. I've seen how that works. Right, me too. We study it from different angles, but... yeah. So, yeah. so there's two categories of, of weapons. There's offensive weapons and defensive weapons. For the most part, there's also like intelligence gathering stuff and things of that nature. But for the most part, offensive weapons and defensive weapons. And at least, at least in modern times, the way weapons get developed is somebody will propose an idea, and it's usually in response to something that's already happening in the world. Like if a certain person has developed an offensive weapon that can hurt you, modern day engineers will work on ways to defend against that. And usually it's a very specific cat and mouse game. I'll give you an example. Like, the gun happens, right? Mm -hmm. So the gun happens and then people can kill people on the battlefield. If they see you in the open and they have line of sight to your position, they can shoot you with a bullet. Well, then the, the British got smart and they're like, you know, we're going to develop this thing. We're going to call it a tank to make people think it's a tank of water, but we're going to develop this thing that can roll and block bullets. So they developed the tank. That was in World War I in France. And so at that point, it's like, oh, snap, you know, now, so the bullet used to have the advantage, but now this tank thing has the advantage. So what do we do? And so everything changed on the battlefield for a very long time until the Germans came up with a way to beat the tank. Uh, eventually, there was something that was developed called the, the shape charge, um, you know, was something, the Monroe effect is what it's called. But long story short, there's a way for explosives to punch through metal. So that was developed. And then after these shape charges could punch through metal, there's another smart person that came up with something called reactive armor, which is a way to defend against the the shape charge that could punch through the metal. So if you can you see the logic change, we went bullet, tank, shape charge, reactive armor. And that's a very narrow tracking of what is re really much more of a spider web of development. You're just, you're tracking one single thread of that development. Uh, yeah, you could say that, but I mean, well, sure. I mean, there are many steps beyond what I, where I just stopped. Yeah. Well, like trenches, for example. Okay. Is it's also a defensive technique that became an offensive technique. And, and so just, if you look at world war one, you introduce the tank, um, you introduce the machine gun, the Gatling gun. Well, it wasn't introduced, but it was brought in. Chemical warfare happens to counteract trenches because you want a chemical that'll sit down and make its way into the trenches, causing people to pop up and out, making them vulnerable to bullets, 
mortars are a part of the equation there. That also, that necessity becomes the mother of invention for uh, even weaponizing airplanes or balloons in battle. Um, mortars can work around the issue of line of sight combat as well. as, And we're just talking World War I here. So I would argue that it, it, it isn't just a single linear development. You swallow the spider to catch the fly. Will swallow the bird to catch the spider. I mean, there's so many different angles that being that are being taken in in all of this development, and that's why I think they would all be developed again. Because you have millions of people on Earth, it's going to occur to someone: we need a really controlled thing that we can shoot from a a lower position that will go over the obstruction and land in someone else's position, but that goes further than we can throw a handheld explosive. So mortars are going to happen every time. I think mortars may happen every time, um, but I don't think every weapon that's developed, maybe it, maybe every class of weapon, you could say that we would eventually end up at missiles. Maybe you could say that. Um, but I don't think every every weapon would happen every time because I've seen too many weapons in their development stages. Whether or not they're built or not depends on if a certain person has influence politically. For example, if you have a certain senator in Congress... Um, he can direct funding to a certain constituency, if I'm saying that right, to so that this particular group of people get a contract. Oh, yeah, huh. we, we need to order X number of these missiles because they're fabricated in, you know, West Bonnaroo, Michigan, making stuff up. So, I mean, those kinds of decisions are made because of political influence and power. They're not necessarily made because of, oh, that's the right technology at the right time. Like, I've been in meetings <laughs> where where those things happen, and I'm like, whoa, this is how the sausage is made. This is amazing. I can't, I had no idea it was like this. You know? Like, think about the space race, for example. Do Let's see, in this little thing we're doing here, do we go to the moon every time? Yes, every time. Really? Yeah, and I think the reason for that is Don Pettit's uh, 10% ratio, the ratio he was talking about when we were in Alabama together, about the... The um, tyranny of the rocket equation? Total, yeah, the tyranny of the rocket equation. Total weight versus the amount of that weight that has to be fuel to get out of the gravity that we just happen to have been dealt on this planet. The moon is going to be the absolutely logical staging ground for your first move as you try to be a, a species that goes into space. I don't know that it does. And the, the reason I don't think it does is because, well, let me ask you this. Is it easier for trains to happen or not happen? It's easier for everything to not happen. Okay. Which is why the fact that there's anything is so mind boggling. Yeah. Nothing yeah. makes more sense than something. I understand that the cosmological argument, but let's talk about, we're talking about. That isn't the cosmological argument, but I'm still with you. Yeah. You, and you, you, I, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, is it easier for trains, like the, the engineered device that m transports things over land on tracks, is it easier for that to happen or not happen? I'm talking about in the context of society and humans. I think it's easier to not happen. Right. So why do you say that we go to the moon every time? I don't think you can make that argument. Here's the difference. Okay. I think I can. You ask a question, I'm going to answer it. Do it. There are a lot of ways to roll over ground. There are a lot of ways to avoid rolling over ground by using water instead. We could come up with some different technology that could theoretically roll over ground and not have trains. So if we went right to automobiles and that was the first thing we invented, would we have bothered with trains or might we have skipped it? I don't know. I think trains always, like, they're always the most efficient way to transport things over ground, I think depending on how we fueled the car. I think we're we're coming at this from two different, or at least I know I'm coming at it from a different angle than you. I think you're answering the question exactly like I asked, but maybe I, I'm doing a bad job. No, you're this not. is essentially this, what this I, is tennis, man. Yeah. Nobody's doing a bad job. This is what I'm thinking here. Let's say, let's get a hundred people together and we're all going to be like, okay, here's the deal. Um, we've got a hundred acres and we're all going to live on this hundred acres. It's like, okay, we need, we need the poo hundred acre woods kind of thing. So we've got to survive. Let's make food, okay? So we all start working, 
and then for some reason Bob Claggett is lazy in his section of the woods because we all know that Bob does not Claggett sound like Bob <laughs> Claggett. Can we pick someone else? It's more fun to pick on Bob Claggett. So because he's the hardest working person we know. Pretty much, yes. Okay. So let's say for some reason Bob Claggett. Oh, okay. Let's flip the analogy. Bob Claggett just works his tail off, and he has so much food, right? So Bob Claggett makes a farm and he makes like robots over there that that make food for him. And I'm over here just like goofing off doing math or something stupid, right? And I don't take the time to farm. But Bob Claggett does. And I go, I'm like, hey Bob, I'm hungry. And he's like, Yeah, dude, you should have you should have built your farm. I was like, I know, but you know, uh, math was cool, and I started drawing this thing. Look at this. It looks like a, a cigar with fins on it. I'm going to call it a rocket. I think this would be cool. He's like, whatever, dude. We're supposed to survive. You got to make food. I get envious of his food, and I go cause conflict, right? Pretty soon, we devolve into factions and all kinds of weird political stuff, and we never get to the place where we make rockets and go to the moon because of all this envy and strife and all this fear, perhaps, that you're talking about, all these things happen. But everything you're describing did happen, and we did go to the moon. We did, right. Why? Because I think that, for example, this whole America idea of freedom, like, hey, we're all going to, you can do whatever you want. You know, let's create a free market, and we're all going to help each other through this idea of fiat currency or whatever. I think the idea of freedom in America goes against entropy because naturally things should tend towards disorder. I mean, I think we're like two drought seasons away worldwide from everything falling apart. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. My point is all these really cool things that we do, like go to the moon, that can only happen once you take steps forward. Like right now, we've got an international space station orbiting in space, and it's supposed to deorbit soon. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, politically, Russia and America were all talking about what we're going to do with it, blah, blah, blah. Some of us are like, well, we spent a lot of time and effort and energy getting it up there. We need to keep it in orbit. And other ones are like, I don't know. We're going to quit working on it after a certain date and time. And we're like, yeah, but we have that much mass, air, and water in orbit. Why don't we just start thrusting it out further and, like, go to a higher orbit? Or, you know, they're talking about things like that. It's very, very hard to keep something like that working. And it depends on peace and stability and people getting along politically, in this case, the U.S. and Russia, in order to keep it in place. So my point is, when I asked, do trains happen every time? It's because it it requires this entire industrial system beneath it in order to sustain it. That's an avalanche of things to respond to, and, and all good. That's not a complaint. Okay. Frederick Jackson Turner, you remember that name? I don't. He delivered a famous paper at the 1893 World Columbian Exposition, the grounds you have visited in Chicago, the, the World's Fair, the Devil in the White City Fair. Right. And I think that paper was called something like, does the frontier experience make America unique? Or maybe that's a book that was written about it after the fact. But in this, he argues that there at the turn of the last century, the frontier was effectively over in America. We were done with that. And that concept of the end of the frontier so captured the imagination of people in the West that Gene Roddenberry, a generation and a half later, when, you know, banging out the the words that he would open Star Trek with, described space as the final frontier. This idea of the frontier is kind of part and parcel with the West and particularly with the United States and Canada. And so the reason the railroad thing was invented in the United States and became prominent here and then was adopted around the world is because, well, it was needed here. It's just the way population distributed and how it happened around the world. If you say life started in Africa, if you say it started in the Fertile Crescent, Africa seems to be winning the day as a guess for where human life came from. Well, it's a really long ways to North America and it's going to take a very long time. So naturally, it's a head start for all the other cultures of the old world 
to develop and build up and fill up land and clutter it up with all kinds of different things where railroads might not make as much sense or be as much of a necessity there, but a tremendous necessity in terms of of a convergence of the timing of where technology was when America was in a position to build railroads. Now, is that a coincidence? So as we argue out what things would happen every time, I think you got to wonder, is it a coincidence? And I would argue, no, it wasn't a coincidence that steam technology was in such a place that railroads would be the obvious solution for accessing this new gigantic unexplored frontier and West. And the reason for that is you had to have a way to reliably move people from the old world to the new world and create sustainable life here. So there's all kinds of, you just had to be in a certain place. And I think as soon as that was technologically feasible, it happened historically. And then people were on the continent where you and I live and people started to spread out. Look, there's no way that the bulk of colonialism and settlement on this continent was going to happen on the West Coast. A little bit happened, but it didn't happen there because it's just way too far to go. People from the Far East weren't going to sail all the way across the Pacific to see if there was a California before people in Europe were going to sail all the way across the Atlantic to see if there's a New York. It makes sense that it all unfolded the way it did just because of geography and climate and distance. And so at the time, the technology is big enough to get us started on the trajectory of the United States. It makes sense that tag on a few generations from there, steam power would logically come down the road next. Somebody's going to figure out how to harness the power of heat and steam and flame and trains are going to make sense and trains are going to happen because, hey, look, there's this giant space we need to access and we just happen to have this new technology that can pull it off. So would trains happen every time? I don't know that I'm ready to argue every time, but some need like that was going to arise every time unless we change the rules of our exercise and make life start in Mexico or Arizona or something like that. In which case, I still think you might end up with trains. It's just that they would be invented in East Asia as that's kind of the last place to get populated and colonized. I'm thinking industrial things is is the direction my brain is going. Like in in the 1800s, you had, you know, the the steam power revolution just took off first, right? Mm -hmm. But you also had the internal combustion engine was developed late in the the 1800s, but the electric motor was invented as well. Mm -hmm. And so all these things were invented at different times right there in that 100-year span. And so... It's not accurate to say the steam engine wasn't invented then. It was much further back in the 1600s. But long story short, all these things are different technologies that were brought to the table at a certain time. And I think there's these really weird inflection points that happen along the way where if a certain technology is adopted and used widely, then it becomes the thing that everybody uses. And it proliferates quicker and it kills out all the other alternatives. Or maybe it doesn't kill them out but adoption happens so quickly that i mean sometimes yes tv hasn't killed radio yeah but my point is if electric motors killed the radio star (laughs) if electric motors are adopted quicker and at a much bigger level and we have ways to store electric power then we go to electric cars quicker but the internal combustion engine happened and you know, that did all kinds of things in terms of us refining fossil fuels. And then once you have fossil fuels, I mean, obviously you make the jump to, for example, the Saturn V rocket used fossil fuels. Did you realize that? No. Yeah. When, when we went to the, the moon, we did it with dinosaurs. Dang. RP-1 is like high-grade kerosene. Oh, no. It's, it's, there's something poetic about going to the moon with dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. So... I think the Earth's physical shape matters a lot, but I think the minds of men and women change things a lot more than you think, and the emotions that they have at any given moment can affect what happens. Like, I've seen decisions being made as a result of someone being in a bad mood. You've seen this? Of course. Yeah. I have seen both you and I baffle the other one with being inattentive to a topic two or three times. And then, I don't know, we're just in the right mood or the right attention for that same question a third or fourth time. 
and all of a sudden we engage with it differently. I know you and I have both done that to each other. It's not even good mood, bad mood. It's just, where's your brain space? Different state of minds. Yeah. I had a boss a while back. I had many bosses, so I can say this because nobody will know which one it was. Um, good. We had this agreement with the uh, <laughs> his administrative assistant. Uh, she had these magnets. <laughs> she had these red magnets and these green magnets. Okay. And you would walk by okay. the office, and if there was a green magnet on the board, then this individual was in a good mood, and it was a good day to go in and propose an idea. It's like the Korean ducks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're talking about the ducks that married couples don't want to talk about whether intimacy should happen or not. So the ducks are just arranged on a desk to non-verbally have the the conversation without having the conversation. If they're facing opposite directions, not tonight. If they're facing at a perpendicular arrangement, maybe. (laughs) If they're facing each other directly, (laughs) this is happening. And if one is like taped to the back of the other one, look out. Dude, I would do so many funny things with ducks if we use that. <laughs> we can't have the ducks. <laughs> we can't. Have the, I'm not mature enough for that. No, I'm not. I'm not emotionally ready for the ducks. Either. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the the state of mind of an individual can shape the course of human history. It literally can. Yeah, I agree. The state of mind of me has shaped the course of history of my life. Do you have like a specific example? Um. No, I'm going to pass on that, but I can think of three or four really good things that have happened because uh, just thoughtlessly, I was in the right place mentally for a conversation here or there. And I can think of some places where I've hurt people in ways that set a trajectory for our relationship and for our lives, where maybe it would have played different if my brain space had just been over here instead of over there. Yeah, it, it matters. I'm I'm sold on what you're saying. Hmm. Okay, so that got deep. We haven't resolved that. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, we just can't can't be done with that just yet. If, I, if I'm flowing the debate, we've got three or four loose ends here still. All the way back to weapons, and this all ties in, I think it is no surprise that you are picturing very complex modern warfare weaponry, and I think it's no surprise that when I threw out that assertion, I'm picturing the historical development of non-mechanized weaponry first and foremost. Yeah. So for example, I think people are always going to figure out how to ride horses. I think there will always be a combat advantage over uh, a foot soldier that, that a mounted knight or warrior will hold. And therefore, I think a halberd will always be developed to pull an armored mounted warrior off of that mount to level the playing field. I think, I mean, it's just five simple chess moves and you're going to arrive at a hooked halberd that can pull somebody off of a mount. Do you agree with that? Yeah, if the enemy decides to attack you on horseback. Right. Like, for example, Rommel and Patton, the way they fought in World War II, like the way those individuals fought dictated the types of things that had to be developed. Yeah. So if we decide we're going to fight on horseback, that's great. But if I roll over the mountain in war elephants because I'm a mahout. You need a longer hook. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think you can yeah. generally say things like bow and arrow is going to happen every time. Every time. And atlatl. Every time. I think an atlatl happens every time. Every time. Yeah. Absolutely. Spear, obviously. Every time. Sword, every time. Every time. Yeah. Yep. I don't think Ninja you... stars. Ninja stars. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my wife From was... From convenience stores in Florida. <laughs> my, my wife was cleaning up the... Uh, <laughs> she was cleaning up the bedroom the other day. And, and she said, hey, um, I, I found a lot of weapons when I was cleaning up. So <laughs> if you'll just open that drawer right there um, and just see what to, to do with those. And I pulled open the drawer and there's like a pistol. <laughs> there's 30 round AK magazines. Uh, there, there's like oh. all, you know, throwing knives. There's all these things in this. And I'm like, is it the throwing knives that we bought in Florida? Totally is. <laughs> and then there's Nerd. this little pouch. And I'm like, what is this? And open it up and it's those stupid throwing stars we bought. <laughs> and I'm just I'm just thinking about my wife's mind as she's cleaning our room. She's like, okay, here's some, uh, okay, 762 by 39, AK are. mags. Oh, throwing stars. That's a weapon <laughs> that goes over here. In the weapon bucket. Yeah. In the we- I'm looking across my office here and over there on a hook where my hat should be hanging is a pair of studded nunchucks. <laughs> and I left 
I left the little orange like like price gun sticker that says fourteen ninety nine on Thank there. You. I'm never taking that off. Thank you so much. I still remember when we bought those nunchucks and the lady was like, "What? What?" You know, just if, trust us, man. This makes sense. This makes perfect sense. Well, I like. Then we went out and threw them like ten feet in the yard and immediately lost like two throwing <laughs> knives. Where did they, they're in a vortex? They're in another dimension we, somewhere. We with looked all the hard people. for those, dude. Thanos snapped away. We. And we had kids looking for that. We had six kids. We incentivized looking. them. They're close to the ground. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it was ridiculous <laughs> that that didn't work out. Yeah. So how did how did what we were get we here? talking about? I don't, oh, I remember. Uh, so, on the bow and arrow question, you were talking about how if we redid history again, maybe not all the weapons would happen because all the weapons are reactionary offense. You defend against that, and and I totally see that pattern. But I also think about historically. Sometimes you don't make something to defend against somebody else's weapon you just make a better version of the thing they already had yeah so you think about the role of the standard bow in warfare in the high high and late are, are you going battle of agincourt you're about to go battle of agincourt well just just welsh longbowmen in general uh but yeah agincourt is where it really stood out I mean, both sides had archers it's just well, what would give us an advantage over those other archers? Well, not shields or arrow-resistant helmets of some sort. That seems like a pain in the butt to make. Just how about the kind of arrows that we can shoot from so far that their arrows can't get to us, and then only our arrows will hit them? Well, that's a great strategy. <laughs> Just make better bows. And it was very effective. You realize that idea progressed forward to the Cold War. Have we had this discussion about the Pershing missile? Have we had this discussion? I feel like maybe. Uh, like the John G. Pershing missile? Yeah. So the idea was they, they meaning the communist. The Illuminati. <laughs> the oh, Soviets. Okay. They put missiles down in Cuba and were like, oh, what the heck? Hmm. You can hit us. That's scary. That. And then yeah. everybody freaked out. And then there's... We're just, everybody's going to make missiles. Everybody has bigger missiles and all this stuff. And what it boiled down to is we parked some Pershing II missiles over there in Germany that could make it right into the heart of Russia and hit like an outhouse. And that kind of stuff mattered. And, and it it was an extension of this, I'm going to make an arrow that can shoot farther than yours and hit the thing that you love the most. It was the same thing, only much bigger technology. So I think... All of these ideas are rooted in the hearts of men, whether we're playing with directed energy, laser weapons, or like in Ender's Game, you know, the doctor device, or we're, we're dealing with sticks and rocks. I think all of these things boil down to the operating system that's running on the hearts of humans. And I think everybody intuitively likes the idea of either them or an advocate on their behalf possessing an offensive weapon that can match the offensive weapon that would be readily available to our imagined enemies. In other words, I want a gun or I want the cops to have a gun. Yeah. So it's not just governments. Like, we want to match it. Equitability is really good for society in terms of you could do this much to me, I could do this much to you. And then you go back to John Locke's idea it would be far better for us to each forfeit a teeny tiny little bit of our freedom to do this to each other and instead to make some kind of deal, a pact, where we won't. Now, sometimes that pact is written down on paper like a constitution or a treaty or a contract. Sometimes that pact is, I see you have a 9 millimeter handgun. I also have a 9 millimeter handgun. It would be far better for both of us if neither of us were irresponsible with this. Whether you do it with paper or you do it just by looking at what the other person has, history says that tends to breed equitability. When that isn't the case, the basic principle of osmosis happens. The less pressure absorbs stuff from the more pressure. And so like, you could start the world over a billion times, and if the entire North American continent is undefended and sparsely populated... You could be like, no, no, England, no settlers. You don't go in there. That's mean. Someone is going in there. It's going to happen every time where there are unprotected resources. Those resources will be claimed through one process or another. Yeah, but what if like gunpowder that the Chinese made back in the day catches on and somebody figures out the gun a thousand years earlier? How does the world look different? 
I mean, what what's the first recorded use of a gun in battle? I don't know. I gotta say, isn't it like the archibeak, the little hand cannon, the Spanish hand cannon, the first thing. Couldn't tell that you. Kind of looks gun like that got used in combat. I, yeah, I would say late Middle Ages, something like that. So what if we bump that back a thousand years? I, I'm not. I'm, I'm just trying to game it out here. Let's operate off the assumption that 13th century is the first time we see that used in warfare in the West. So we go back to the time of Constantine and add gunpowder into the mix. Well, it would certainly make the sieges of the Crusades and... They end quicker, don't they? Yeah, they end quicker. The Ottomans show up and they tear down Vienna a lot quicker and the the winged hussars... Oh, the Ottomans had gunpowder. Yeah. Did, oh, did they oh, have I cannons? see why you needed to go there. Yeah. Yeah, they had gunpowder. Oh, really? Plenty of it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, maybe Maybe it changes the longevity of the Roman Empire or maybe it just creates a new Roman Empire. Whoever has the gunpowder takes whatever Rome was holding at the time, and now they're the big dogs. My wife and I started a, a series on Amazon Prime last night. Yeah. Um, we're two episodes in. I have no idea if it's going to continue to be good, but it's called The Man in the Glass Castle. No, the Man in the High Castle. Ha- high I've Castle? It. Yeah, Philip K. Dick. Oh, it's phenomenal. Man in the High Castle. It is what we're doing right now. So basically, it's if Germany and Japan win World War II. Yeah. And it's interesting because I can see this Cold War developing between Germany and Japan. Yes. Which is the same thing that happened between, you know, the West and, and the Soviets. Yep. Have you watched the whole thing? I, I have. Yeah, absolutely love it. I'm only two episodes in, so don't tell me anything. Do you recommend watching all of it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I, have we not talked about this? No. I didn't know you watched it. I, I mean, I reviewed it on TMBH. Did you really? I did. Philip K. Dick also did A Scanner Darkly and the um, super, super po- uh, Tom Cruise movie, Future Crime, Minority Report. Minority Report. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this guy, he is Black Mirror before Black Mirror. In fact, I think Amazon tried to make like a Black Mirror knockoff with all Philip K. Dick stuff, but he's writing in like Gene Roddenberry era. So this is all like 50s, 60s, 70s kind of stuff. It's cool. Oh, it's It's good. really cool. Yeah. It's interesting to think how all this stuff happens. And if we just game it out differently, I mean, everything happens the same, but different. <laughs> okay, third chair. I think I understand what it's like to be sitting where you're sitting right now. You're listening to something that is obviously life-changing internet gold. Like the kind of thing that you take... And you put deep down into your heart and it fuses with who you are at the level of your essence and it it changes you. And that's the kind of thing where you're like, wow, what can I do to be a part of this and make it so that more life-changing things like this happen for me? And the answer is very simple. And uh, Destin, sing the song. Go to patreon.com slash no dumb questions and you can support the show. And you! That was really good, buddy. I tried hard. (laughs) Thank you. Can I switch away from all this war talk and ask you something else? Yes, I accept. That was fun. Thank you for indulging it. What about bridges? Do all the bridges happen in the same places that the bridges currently are? (laughs) Let me ask you this. If the world started over a billion times and we did this podcast a billion times and we decided to do this episode a billion times, do you think our lists would be identical all billion times too? Oh, because I also have that. (laughs) No, I don't don't have that. (laughs) No. Yeah, I do have that. I don't know. Bridges. What do you think? Well, not all of them, but some of them. Like, I think the Panama Canal happens every single time because of the way the land is set up. It's like, well, we can yeah, we can spend a lot of time and dig a thing right here. Yeah. Or we can go all the way around South America. Suez Canal is the same way. Yeah, every time. It has to happen yep. if society is sufficiently advanced. And again, if we assume that life starts in somewhere between Africa and Mesopotamia every time, then again, I would argue that the amount of time it takes for humanity to expand to a sustainable form of developed life in the new world is going to be about the same time frame that the technology needed to dig canals would be in place. So yeah, I think I think those two canals happen. Everybody's going to be upset we haven't read Guns, Germs, and Steel. Have you read it? 
No, I haven't. I haven't either. I haven't either. Supposedly it talks about this. It talks about pack animals in South America. It talks about, you know, disease and how that shapes the world, all this type of thing. What I was going to suggest, and this is where I think we overlap here. I was going to suggest that two absolutely vital, constantly fought over parts of the world. Well, three, excuse me, would be the Bosporus, the straits that lead you into the Black Sea from the Mediterranean Sea. So where Constantinople, Istanbul, Byzantium, whatever you want to name that town. Can you spell that, please? Bosporus? B-O-S-P-O-R-U-S, I think. On the banks on the mighty Bosporus. I think that's right. Okay. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Let me just ask you, and you just explain it to me the very... I, I'm supposed to know what the Bosporus is, but I don't. What, what is it again? Okay, the Bosporus is, you could call it a river, but it's more of like a strait almost. It's that little thing that gets you from the Mediterranean Sea into the Black Sea. So it's where Constantinople or Istanbul or Byzantium, depending on when you ask, where that city is always sat. That's where that's at? Yeah. It's a pinch point. I feel dumb for not knowing that. So essentially, if you're coming from any of the big, massive areas of ancient civilization and you want to go into mainland Europe, you can walk all the way up through mountains and brutal terrain to go around the Black Sea, or you can cross the Bosporus. And that's what everybody had to do. And that's why that's such a pivotal point and why that town is so important. I think people would have fought over that location. That would have been the pinch point, the place where we must defend one way or the other, even if you started history over a bazillion times. Okay, so for the third chair, to draw a mental image here, so imagine you have, to oversimplify it, imagine you have the Mediterranean Sea, and on the far right side of the sea, you have Turkey. This is in the top right corner there. Mm -hmm. And there's this bigger body, of, or not bigger, a, a, another body of water up above Turkey there, and that's the Black Sea. Mm-hmm. And there's this little bitty, I didn't even know this, and I feel dumb for not knowing this, but there's this little bitty strait that connects the two. And when I say little bitty, I mean little. How, how far apart is it? If a, is that natural? I, I don't know. It's a few miles. It can't be more than 30, maybe 50. I, I don't know the answer, but it's not very much. Oh, wow. Here is a picture taken from the International Space Station in 2004. Man, I wonder who uh, took that. Okay, so to... To paint the picture fully here, you, you really kind of have two pinch points, right? And the Bosporus tends to be the one that people fight over because it gets you where you're going faster. And if you go to the other, you have to backtrack. So the Aegean Sea is the part of the Mediterranean that's by Greece, right? And picture that. Yep. And if you go toward the Black Sea from the Aegean Sea, you go through this strait called the Dardanelles into the Sea of something. Mamra, Marmra, something like that. I can never remember. Marmara, M-A-R-M-A-R-A. -A. I do. Let me do the same. That, that so you have Mediterranean right. Sea connects to the Aegean Sea. Mm -hmm. And just above the 40th parallel, you have the Sea of Marmara. Marmara, there we go. And you have two straits there. You've got the Bosporus is the one on the north that connects to the Black mm -hmm. Sea. Mm -hmm. And the Dardanelles is below mm -hmm. that connects to that little sea. Holy cow, war yeah. happens there all the time. It, like every single simulation we run, there's always going to be war right there, isn't there? I think there will be, especially because of where life is going to start every single time we run the simulation. So, I mean, we wouldn't have any need for there to be fighting there if life started in Siberia. But life didn't start in Siberia. That doesn't make any sense. The river civilizations are where life started. And you know when I told you about uh, Xerxes whipping the Hellespont? Yes. Okay, the Hellespont, I I'm almost positive, is the Dardanelles. Really? Yeah, it's, it's maybe it's either the whole stretch or just one particular part of the strait. But that's called the Hellespont. Looking it up. Okay. Yep. Yep, it is. It's the, it's the Dardanelles. Okay, fair enough. So I think that pinch point will be a conflict conflict zone every single time in history. Second, I think Israel will be a conflict zone that everybody will fight over, whether we start it all over and there's the same religion or not, religions or not, 
people are going to fight over that place because it's an intersection between three continents. You just can't get around the fact that Jerusalem and that stretch that we call Judea historically is going to be contested. It's going to be an issue. All the river civilizations in the West are going to have to run right through there to go and fight with each other. So I think it's going to be a pitch, uh, pinch point too. I think the Strait of Hormuz is a pretty big one too. Uh, up there above Saudi Arabia, below Iran. I agree. Why do you think that though? I, mean, I think that one depends a lot on our dependence on fossil fuels, whether or not that's how we run our cars or if we ended up with electric motors before internal combustion engines, assuming we ever even invent internal combustion engines. Uh, I think the Strait of Hormuz is important because uh, if you can control that, you can control all the resources that come out of the Persian Gulf. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, And because that Persian Gulf sits right on the ancient cradle of civilization, that little strait, that little bump coming out into the, effectively the Indian Ocean eventually, you're always going to see fighting there. And what do you know? It's been a hugely contested hotspot. You know what's so fun is I've got Google Earth just up on my computer you need to do that. I'm just pivoting the globe around and I'm looking at all these different areas and I'm like, hmm, would I want to use that to get places? Y- you know, a place that I think will become increasingly more important is the, the little gap of land in between Alaska and Russia. Or, excuse hmm. me, not gap of land. Over there near the Bering Sea. The uh, the little, the shot that goes in between the Bering Sea and what looks like it's called the Chuchi, Chukchi Sea above Alaska there. Like, I think that's going to become increasingly more important. Hmm. I'm going there right now. I've got Google Earth up here. Oh, that's interesting. Boy, that is. Using this logic, we can look backwards in time and say, oh, yeah, obviously we're going to do things there, blah, blah, blah. But we could also look forwards in time and we can say, I bet that's going to be important. I don't know about that stretch. I mean, uh, yes. Further, yes, I totally agree. That stretch may be important, but man, that is impassable terrain up there there's no road that gets you anywhere near that little point of almost contact in northwest alaska i mean that is nothing out there well well, i mean think about it it's that way now but is it going to continue to be that way okay i'm I'm switching over to satellite imagery strategically that's just so much fuel to move i mean to me it seems like Unless there's a technological pressure that means that you couldn't theoretically move weapons of war or vehicles into the U.S. from Russia or into Russia from the U.S. some other more conventional way, that would be the only reason either side would look to try to take advantage of that little stretch. No, but but think about it with a different brain. So just have the you're thinking about it with, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're thinking about it with your current uh, context, right? I mean, so if if we... We're sitting here in the present, and we're looking at Panama Canal, and we're like, oh, obviously that would happen. I mean, just look at the way the the ratio of the water to land is. I mean, that's a really small area, and obviously you can start crossing there. The reason right now, the reason we don't pass a lot of stuff between Alaska and Russia at that little spot way up there is because we don't like each other, and we don't work together. But what if something political changes— and we become friends. It would have to be a pretty dang big political event. Yes. I mean, at that point, right there, at the very, very tip of Alaska and Russia, I mean, I'm looking right now on the map. Was We've got 30 miles, 40 miles between the two right there? Uh, maybe. Maybe a little more. But don't you think technology would have to change dramatically, too, for that to be a more effective way? to move things between the continents. What do you mean? I mean, you got to overland stuff forever to move it across the U.S. and Canada to get up to that point in Alaska. I mean, ships are always going to be the most efficient way of, of getting stuff between continents, but I don't know. This is what I'm doing. I'm looking at the whole globe, and I'm looking at the pinch points, and I, I'm seeing things like, you know, the Panama Canal. I'm seeing uh, Gibraltar. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm seeing the English Channel. Uh, these are major points where stuff matters. In Denmark, I mean, like, okay, do this. Zoom into Denmark. Oh, this is on my list. Go ahead, though. 
I'm going to give you this one. G- zoom really far into Denmark, right? And so... Oh, yeah. I, I know what I'm looking at. I'm on my way I, there, but I know... I, sure, yeah. The path into the Baltic Sea. Okay. There's nothing. What do you mean there's nothing? I mean, it's almost nothing. Yeah, you could just put a net across it and practically fence it off. Yeah, but, but look at all the roads. There's roads everywhere. You got Copenhagen, you, you got or Copenhagen, however you say that. You've got all these cities there, and you've got actual bridges across it. But look at the distance there. It's pretty tight. Yeah. But there's bridges spanning it. Why? Because civilization is there and active because of the, the population of humanity in that specific place. Who's to say in 200 years, now spin the globe around and go in over there to Alaska and Russia? Who's to say in 200 years after the next great war, when you know the sides go stupid and, and hurt each other, in ways where civilization starts to rebuild in certain areas, who's to say that we don't start populating that area up there? And if you'll just superimpose in your mind bridges and towns and settlements all over that area of the globe, who's to say that doesn't happen? Yeah, and if climate change is what many purport it to be, that would make a difference there as well. Oh, if that happens, I mean... Climate change has certainly affected all of these pinch points that we're talking about. Yeah. Because if we started the world over right now with the climate as it is, nobody would have a lot of use for Iraq. Because of all the sand. It, it would not be nearly the desirable place that it was. So you're on Google Earth. You look at that at that map. If you had a Google Earth that would time lapse accurately, and you could take this back to the dawn of human writing and civilization, I guarantee you that one, the ancient coastline wouldn't even look like it does the Persian Gulf would be bigger. Kuwait probably wouldn't exist. And you'd see green all throughout that thing that's called the Fertile Crescent. You look at it now, it doesn't look like a very Fertile Crescent at all. So the pressure points have changed as climate has changed over time. Even in uh, what we call Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, what Africa is has changed over time because of the creep of the Sahara Desert. Even at different times in history, the really dangerous area of the southern Mediterranean has changed as the Sahara has blown to form dunes in the southern Mediterranean by the time of uh, travel in the Roman Empire. It changed the routes that people would travel the Mediterranean world because these dunes were incredibly dangerous, whereas centuries earlier, maybe that wasn't the case so much. So I think climate change is a really important factor to consider in our little experiment here. Have you heard of Pakistan's billion tree tsunami? Pakistan is also on my list. This is so dang interesting, but no, I have not heard of that. So Pakistan is like, okay, here's the deal. We're going to plant trees and we're going to like remake a nation that's, uh, you know, so we can control erosion. We can affect local temperate climates and things like that. So Pakistan is super, super, super serious about planting 10 billion trees in their nation. 10 billion. Billion, with a B, yeah. Have you ever planted a tree? I have. I'm looking at one I planted right now. That's cool. It was a stick, like three and a half feet tall. I put it in the ground out there five years ago. Now it's 35 plus feet. I need to do that more. I Googled fastest growing tree. (laughs) <laughs> and then I bought it and I put it in the ground. That was my only caveat. I just want shade. Anything. I don't care what it does. Just, just grow. So Pakistan's doing it. They're like, you know what? We need trees. And I guess it was, uh, I, I want to say Ecuador. Forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. There was a problem that was happening. People were just going and just cutting down trees for firewood. And it got to the point where, you know where the thermocline is, right? Where above a certain altitude, trees won't grow. Sure. Well, the problem was these people were cutting down so many trees that it was affecting the ability of trees to grow in that area because the soil was changing. There's some George Washington Carver stuff going on, and they just couldn't get trees to grow anymore. So at this point, I want to say, well, don't misquote me on this, but I want to say it's illegal to cut down trees. Okay, Ecuador tree law, forest legality. In Ecuador, trees now have rights. Whatever. I'll have to I'll have to do more research on that. Anyway, the point is, I think that we can look at this globe and we can look at how it looks right now 
and think about the decisions we as humans have made throughout history within the context of our geopolitical systems and think about what could happen moving forward and make decisions based on that. That would be a valuable way to look at the world. Hmm. Like Northern Canada, the part that nobody cares about, that becomes really, really important. Wolverine cares about it. <laughs> look at it. You go to Northern Canada, assuming that you don't freeze to death instantly, you could just get in a boat and you could go all around there. It's like a, it's like water world up there. It's amazing. Yeah. I've been a pretty good distance up into Canada and it's stunning. What people think of as that beautiful green Rocky Mountain West, there isn't actually very much of that. You've got little pockets in Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada. California's got quite a bit. Oregon's got quite a bit on the coast. Those get rough inland. Idaho is is really green and mountainy. Wyoming's got way more than you'd figure. And Colorado, like half the state, is green, beautiful mountains. But the rest of the West is kind of arid, like high, scrubby plains, badlands kind of stuff. Canada, not the case. Canada is it's just green and mountains and snow. Not even as far as the eye can see. That's such an understatement. It's like a universe of that environment. It's insane. I wonder if Canada is secretly rooting for climate change. <laughs> <laughs> I have to hope not. <laughs> Me too. But I wonder if they're like, yes. <laughs> Finally, we will no longer be America's hat. Now they will be our boot. Because <laughs> if you think about it, like look at the uh, the claims in the northern part of the world. I mean, Canada's sitting pretty good. You know who else is sitting pretty good? Norway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things are going okay over there. Okay, last thought on pinch points. Yeah. The other one historically that I think would be a point of tension forever would be the Khyber Pass. Where's that at? Uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan oh, yeah. in modern day, but it's it's how you accessed India. Yep. There's no other good way to get through there. And so it was going to be another one of those pinch points. So. In addition to saying, yes, I agree that war would always happen, I think I would go further and say war will always happen in these specific places. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? I'm trying to find the Khyber Pass. Oh, man, this is great. I went to the Wikipedia page of Khyber Pass. Mm -hmm. What comes up? A battery Mm -hmm. of heavy artillery being pulled by elephants. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm there. I see it. Good. Heavens. Yes. Golly, that we went full circle there, didn't we? Yeah, it's you know kind of weird, wasn't it? You know what's on top of those elephants? Say it. Um, oh, uh, m- 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 uh, Mahouts. Mahouts. Dang it. I, Mahouts. I, I like to think I learned things, but I didn't have that. Wow. You know what else is there? A train. Wow. This is crazy. It, it's all the things. It's crazy. This is okay. a really fun exercise, but I don't want to be quite done yet. So okay, cool. Do you, do you have a couple that you think are just kind of fun on your list? Uh, yeah. Flags. Do you think flags happen every time? Some sort of banner happens every time. George R. R. Martin ran a simulation of what would happen if you started medieval England over a gazillion times, and there are definitely banners in it. So one <laughs> no. smart person thought about it and decided there would be. Do, do you think flags happen every time? Or, or somebody, like for example, think, think about the resources in the ground. Like, mm-hmm. I think if a, if a people group have access to a certain type of dye, they will naturally, for example, in modern warfare, there's some people that use green tracers, some people that use red tracers, the people that use... Oh, yeah, because of what they have. Yeah. So, for example, um, the Russian and Chinese tracer ammo uses barium, which fires green, but the U.S. has more strontium, I'm assuming, so you get red tracers and so it's a function of what's in the ground in that local area so the greek flag is this stark blue and white and where i thought you were going was to say that banners would be representative of colors that feel indigenous or familiar to a people of a given area oh well i mean ireland you i understand the green i don't understand the the orange is that a historical remnant from the dutch presence in the monarchy there Dude, um, we could do a whole thing the, on flags. You're right. Yeah, we could. We need to back right out of that. Uh, yes, I think people are going to want to identify under a banner. And in fact, 
we did an exercise in my history classes, my uh, World Civ One classes, where we'd start with ancient history. Have I told you about this? No. Okay. I would bring in a giant bowl of Skittles. I mean, giant bowl. And I would go around without explaining to anyone what I was doing. And I would just take different sized handfuls and drop them on their desk at the beginning of one session of class. Then I would go to the front and explain how many extra credit points toward your final grade were available if you were still alive at the end of the, of the day, at the end of the class. And then all, of course, hands start going up. Well, what are we doing? Oh, you'll figure it out. Well, what are the rules? Don't die. Uh, okay. And then I would have this whole, this other jar that was filled with uh, little folded up pieces of paper that had scenarios. And I would just pull one out and it would say something like, uh, okay, raiders are attacking. You will need two defense units to keep them from stealing 50% of your gold. What's a defense unit? That's a red Skittle. What's gold? That's a yellow Skittle. And you've got 30 seconds until the raiders arrived. And then people would scramble around and be like, uh, what do we do? And they'd all just sit there for the first turn. And then I'd show up and I'd be like, the Raiders have arrived. Let's see who put out their defenses. And I'd walk by the desks, almost like the Passover death angel. And if somebody had out two red Skittles, well, they had defenses. They're fine. If they didn't, I'd just eat half their yellow ones until my face was full of yellow Skittles. I'd go back to the front. Be like, okay, I'm going to see what happens next. Oh, oh, well, we've got a famine coming up. And you are going to need to have X number of green Skittles, which is food stores, or you're dead and the game is over. And people would be like, what the heck? This is just what I got dealt. I'm like, yeah, tough nuts. I don't know. You saw how I did it. I just grabbed a handful and gave it to you. How come that guy got more? 20 seconds. This game is crap. 15 seconds. And all of a sudden, people start for the first time to be like, uh, can I have one of yours? Can I have one of yours? Well, I'll give you some army. Like, and then they start they start bargaining with each other. Five, four, three, two, one. Dead, 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 dead. And then all like all these people are just sitting there and they're out of the game for the rest of the day and they're angry. Well, tough. That's what you got dealt. And so we would do this. And I ran this simulation, dude. I mean, I ran this simulation in my classes that I taught in Africa, in Zambia. Got the same results. I ran this simulation with classes that I taught at four different institutions in the United States. Got the same results. By the end of the class... By simply writing down things that definitely happen all the time in history, gradually people would gain an upper hand either through shrewd negotiation or having been just given the right combination of Skittles by sheer dumb luck to bring people under their care. And by the end of each class, there were always multiple kingdoms. And by the end of each class, somebody would have the idea of not waiting for me to draw the next event and just say we attack you and they'd be like you can't do that and they'd look at me and i'd just shrug and all of a sudden they push all their little red skittles to the middle and wait for the other team to push theirs to the middle and the other team has fewer and then everybody that, looks at me like did that work i'm like you have more red skittles you killed did, them does that happen every time every time you end up with a king i've never done the simulation where you don't end up with a king was this your idea yes it was did you hand out these Skittles like as the game goes? Like, do, do you hand out more resources or is it just what they're yes. dealt with to begin with? Yeah, uh, there, there was, I, I'm giving you the quick version, but there was a resource allocation schedule. So after like every draw, you would get dealt this, this, and this, but people started to figure out how they could invest to get more return on what they did. And basically I just tried to very simply apply the same pressures that planet earth applies to people and see how they would respond psychologically and so my argument would be based on, I would say, actual research and actual testing, I would argue that kings will happen every single time. Really? Maybe not forever, but at some point in history, you're going to have kings. So you're saying, is, one of my things I wrote down, a note that I have here, says that, I have to read it directly so that you can tell that I'm not making it up. I feel like this American idea of freedom goes against entropy. And so it's it's a very fragile thing that has to exist. I was in D.C. a couple of days ago, and I read on a large building in front of me, government by the consent of the governed. Yeah. And so you're telling me that kings happen. You're not telling me that a democratic republic happens every time. Uh, I'm not sure a democratic republic happens every time. 
but I also didn't give my classes enough time to simulate that out. Though I will say this, there were times that democratic republics did come into being. Uh, Serfdom always happened. Some smart person would be like, no, I'm not bailing you out. And they'd be like, here's everything I have. And they're like, no, it's not enough. I'll give you half of what I get at the next resource distribution. Okay, you're under my protection. Whoa. So serfdom happened every time, and it was always the shrewdest who gained serfs. But occasionally, there would be a few people of medium power, and they would create a coalition to oppose a king, and they would vote. They wouldn't just go raw power. It happened less often than just kings, but it did happen. And, and I ran the simulation mm, 20, 25 times. Dang. We need to do that and film it. That'd be really fun, wouldn't it? You could also write out how to do this for teachers everywhere. Be a good history nugget. Yeah, it would be a good history nugget. Is it true to say that the results were a function of the software loads on the minds of the students? I think that's a fair way to describe it. I mean, obviously, I told you I put time pressure on them. I put an external pressure to succeed in class on them. So all of those things kind of mess with the results, but that was the best way I could simulate the threat of death without actually threatening to kill students, which hmm. I'm against. Dang, man, this is awesome. I'm glad you like it. What was the coolest thing that ever happened? The, the coolest thing that ever happened when you were running the simulation? Wow, that's a really good question. I think I might have already told you that. I think the democratic coalition that came together to oppose a king. Yeah, I can think of an one simulation that happened at a community college in Nebraska I thought I knew how it was going to turn out because I'd seen this happen enough times. I was sure I knew who the king was going to be. I could see people falling into line. And then a weaker coalition pooled their resources, became effectively a democratic republic, and with fewer resources beat a king. And that's the only time I ever saw that happen. But with the way resources were allocated, the inefficiency of the king and serfdom method was eclipsed by the efficiency of voluntarism. Dude, that's awesome. It was really fun. I have one more fun one. Do you mind if I throw it out? Yeah, but before you do that, I'd like to just say, I would love to play Risk with you, and I'd love to play Axis and Allies just to get destroyed, because I'm confident you would destroy me. Yeah, we've talked about that before. I I don't know. I mean, I do okay at those games, but I think the real fun would be having your weapons tester, designer, defense systems mind on that. And having my big picture tactics strategy history mind on it. It would I think it just make for really fun conversations. Man, that'd be good. Yeah. That'd be really good. We should record that if we do it. We should. Okay, that, anyway, uh, go ahead. Ne- next thing. Baseball Ray. I think there would most definitely be baseball. I think there'd no be baseball. Way. Okay. No, there's there's okay. no way. Here's here's what I really mean though. No, not a billion out of a billion times. If baseball no happened every time they would eventually arrive at 90 feet for the base pads. That's what I really mean. Every time baseball happened, you're going to figure out that the base pads need to be 90 feet and that other stuff doesn't make sense. Really? It's a perfect distance, man. Imagine Mm. if it's, imagine if it's 92 feet to first base. I think it's a function of the coefficient of restitution of the baseball itself. Uh, yeah, which is why softball can play at... And the size of the ball itself. Yeah, so softball plays with 60-foot base pads, but, I mean, the scoring is completely shanked. I mean, softball's okay, but especially slow slow pitch softball is a vastly inferior game. Fast pitch softball has different dimensions and functions more like baseball. It's just the dimensions are adapted for the ball and the speed of the game. I think you're baiting me into a debate, and I will take the bait. I think slow pitch softball might be, I'm not going to say inferior oh. and I'm not going to say superior. Oh. I think it's an equally interesting game because, oh. well, I mean, think about baseball. You're spending most of your time sitting there watching a guy pitch. Slow pitch softball is all about defense and, you know, placing your hits. I think slow pitch softball is an awesome, awesome game. I played church league forever and I love the fact that you can place where you put the ball. We had this one guy tall guy named Ray, he would always just drop one right over the first baseman's head. He was that good. I played third base a lot, 
That is a scary place to play. It is a hot church corner. league softball. Mm-hmm. Holy cow, dude. I'm glad I came out of that league with my teeth and my gonadulars. <laughs> it is <laughs> a scary thing. I think you're right. I think the dimensions on a baseball field naturally evolve to a certain a certain length. But mm-hmm. I do honestly think it's a function of the coefficient of restitution of the ball and the size of the ball and the mass of the ball, the drag yes. coefficient, all those things. Totally agree. So if we assume that a baseball is a baseball is a baseball, 90 feet is the correct distance, and whoever's designing the game will eventually land on that number. Hmm. 89, and everybody's safe. 92, and everybody's out. I don't know about that, man. Well, not I everybody. Know. I mean, of course, there are situations where people beat it out by more. But in a game that is decided by such a narrow margin over such a large sample size, that little tweak would make such a difference. I just love that game. It's so fascinating. Do you have one more? You got to shut it down. I got to shut it down. But um, that whole conversation just makes me more and more excited about you coming to a Trash Pandas game with me. Oh, I'm pumped. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just excited to go out and like take legit BP and infield with you. We still haven't done that. Yeah, we haven't. Yeah, we need to get to all these things. I don't know, man. I'm just not super interested in taking hot grounders anymore. Oh, well, I just won't make them hot then. I feel like I made it through without getting ridiculously injured. Well, just don't get injured. Cool, man. This was a blast, dude. Wait, I'm going to read the rest of my list. Ready? <clears throat> yeah, yep. Viking raiding would have happened mm-hmm. every time in one form mm-hmm. or another. Ice skates and snowshoes would have happened. Dog domestication. Superheroes. Ads. And um, I had one more. Oh, yeah. And more complicatedly, high culture and low culture. There's always going to be stuff that fancy people prefer. There's always going to be stuff that not fancy people prefer. Dude, that's good. That was a fun list. Yeah, those things would have been fun. What's the rest of your list? No, it's not even like I just went through the the bulk of mine. I have offensive weapons, defensive weapons, flags, weapons, Panama Canal, human conflict, that kind of stuff. Bricks. Yeah, my list is pretty small. So we both have one more. That is undoubtedly the one thing that would definitely happen every single time if you restarted the world. And should we say it on three? Do you have yours? Uh, Yeah, I've totally got mine. Okay. One, two, three, farting <laughs> and pulling the covers over your head to make your wife have to smell it. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't that say one. anything. I didn't say anything. Okay. No. Dutch ovens. <laughs> Dutch ovens. One billion times out of one billion. That's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> dad dad jokes maybe dad jokes <laughs> i think dad jokes happen every time i think they do speaking of which i need to go address that rabbit trail <laughs> okay yeah. oh dear yes i <laughs> i hope it's not too ugly this was really really fun if i gradually think of another dozen i'm gonna write them down and we're gonna revisit this conversation sure i'm okay. game man cool buddy I'm game yeah this is a blast fun, dude. thanks for doing it thanks dude Peace, buddy. See you. Later.